and welcome back to Quantum Mechanics. Last time, we talked about ladder operators, and today, we're going to talk about what should have been, hypothetically, the first potential that we looked at when we tried to solve the Schrodinger equation, or the time-independent Schrodinger equation, for specific cases. That is, the free particle. Now, I mean, from the name, you probably know what a free particle is. It's a particle with zero potential. What does that mean? Well, zero potential, since the gradient of potential is force, obviously implies zero force. At least classically. So, if there's zero force, what happens if we plug into F equals MA? Well, this becomes minus d d x u, at least in one dimension, equal to m v squared x d t squared. And if this goes to zero, then you integrate twice, and you find out m x is actually equal to c, oh, so with respect to t, of course, c t plus d. So x is equal to 1 over m times ct plus d. And at the end of the day, that's basically just c1t plus c2. Which means that it's just going to be moving at a linear pace. It might even just stay at rest. And that makes sense, right? If something is moving in one direction, and there's no force slowing it down, what reason does it have to deviate from its constant velocity? So that's how a free particle works. In Newtonian mechanics, it should be the simplest of all possibilities. But how does it work in quantum mechanics, at least for the one-dimensional Schrodinger equation? Well, we can basically copy off when we did things for the infinite square well. There, we discovered that when you're at zero over the length of the well, the solution is e to the i c x. But here's the kicker. The solution outside of this area is zero because of the infinite potential. I mean, imagine if there were infinite walls of force holding you back. What would even be the probability of you getting past those infinite walls of force? Zero, right? So that explains why the wave function is zero. But the free particle is what happens when we take the width of the infinite square well and extend it to infinity. Now, that means the entire wave function is always e to the i c x. It's allowed to just flat free, and that is not a good thing. Why? Because if you take the integral of the modulus squared, well, what's the modulus of this? That's better written as the function times its conjugate. And the conjugate of ICX is just negative ICX. And, ooh, hold up, wait a minute. Since we're integrating over the entire real line, to find the normalization constant that we have to multiply this by to make a viable solution, well, what happens when we do this? It becomes minus infinity to infinity. Well, this becomes a constant, 1, and if there's an amplitude, it becomes a squared, which becomes, wait a minute, 1 times infinity minus negative infinity? How does that even make sense? Well, at the end of the day, what infinity minus infinity to infinity means is the limit as b approaches infinity for some b of the integral from minus b to b of 1 dx. So the integral of 1 dx from minus b to b is b minus minus b, which is just 2b. And the limit as b approaches infinity of 2b diverges. Hey, wait a second. That means the quantum free particle doesn't exist. There is no such thing 
as a free particle in quantum mechanics. Well, at least that's what we think so far. Sure, the wave function is non-normalizable, but does that mean that this is useless? Well, actually, as we'll come to see, no, because every single viable solution will actually end up being a power series of these non-viable solutions. One last thing. In classical mechanics, normally, when we have some potential function like this, we can treat it like a roller coaster track. And the object, like, you know, the roller coaster. If its to initial total energy is too low, it's going to get stuck in some well and, you know, settle down. But if it's high enough, then it's going to be able to escape that well and keep going on. Just like if a roller coaster's velocity is too low, by the end of the track, it's going to go into the low part and get stuck. It's not actually going to reach the end. So, those are classical turning points. And in fact, we have a quantum exact equivalent to these turning points that happens whenever this factor is greater than zero or less than zero. Well, actually, it's greater than the potential at plus minus infinity or less than the potential at plus minus infinity. But most of the time, these go to zero. In only very enigmatic cases do they go to values that are non-zero. So that's about it for today. Thanks, everyone, for watching.